Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Inshallah, we'll continue at number 51. In teaching a lesson on the concept of thirds, uh, Ms. Chu uses, uh, uses a divide and set aside procedure. Okay. She starts with a certain number of colored disks, divides them into three equal groups, and sets aside one to illustrate one third. So it starts with a bunch of disks and divides it into three equal parts and gets rid of one of them to show the kids that's how that's one third. Then she repeats the procedure by taking the disk she had not set aside and dividing them into three groups and then setting one of these groups aside. If Ms. Chu wants to be able to complete the divide and set aside procedure at least four times without breaking any of the disk into pieces, which of the following is the minimum number of colored disks she can start with. This is an interesting question. What it's saying is this, I think. So she ha she has certain number of disks. Let's say she has only three disks. Okay, she set three disks, and then she divides it into three parts. So she sets aside this. Now she's got only two, but she wants to be able to do this again. Okay, uh, without breaking them. Well, we can't divide two disks into three parts, can she? Okay, what if she starts with um, one, two, three? Okay, uh, six plates, so six this. So then she divides this into third, okay, and oh, then sets this apart, and she can't divide that into third, can she? Well, let's see if she had like this, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine this. Okay, she had nine of them. Okay, then she would do, okay, so this would be one third of nine. Okay, that's gone. And then she has six left, right? Okay, one third of six is three, and then divide them into ten like that. So that's what she wants to do. So she wants to be able to demonstrate this third concept and by dividing into four times. So she wants to take the first time and divide it by one third. And then the second time she wants to divide it again by 3. And the third time she wants to divide it again by 3. And the third time she wants to divide it by 3. Now, this is easy if you can see this. and I, I don't quite know how to explain it otherwise. If she just has like 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 number of, of disks, okay? So in other words, if she has 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 number of disks, she would divide it with, uh, by, by the third the first time, that would be gone. And the second time she would divide by third and that would be gone. Third time she would divide by third and that would be gone. And the fourth time it would be one third of third would be like one, right? So one. So that's how many uh, disks she would need. So if you can imagine this, right? She would divide by 3 and divide by 3, divide by 3 and divide by 3. So basically you're looking for multiples of 3. So she would need this many disks. Okay, so that's 3, this is 3 squared is 9, 9 times 9 is 81. So she would need 81 disks. It's a curiously interesting question. And uh, the answer is 81. So she would need 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 because she wants to divide by 1 third. The next week she wants to she wants to explain the concept of four. You know that she need four times four times four. If she wants to do it four, uh, ex, ex, do that three times or four. If she wants to do that four times, etc. She so better get some discs. Okay, now fifty-two. Which of the following is true for all consecutive integers m and n, such that m is less than n? Okay, so which of these is true if you have consecutive integers. Consecutive integers, of course, are integers, as you recall, that are like right next to each other on the number line. Let's give ourselves some examples, like negative 4 and negative 3 are consecutive integers. So are 2 and 3, and so are 5 and 6. Okay, just as an example. Okay? Um, so that's what we're doing. So this is M and this is N. This is M. This is N. This is M. This is N. So just imagine you have some set of consecutive integers like that. So which one of these is true? Okay. That's 52. Okay, M is odd. Well, that makes no sense. If they're consecutive integers, they could be like 2 and 3. That's M and N. M is less than M. Okay. M is even. N is odd. Well, it's only this case. Okay. So that makes no sense. 
it could be either one, right? And m minus n is even, okay? Well, let's see just with their examples. m minus n, so, okay? And m is the smallest one, 2 minus 3, that's negative, that's odd. And 5 minus 6, that's negative 1, that's odd. Okay, so that's clearly not the case. Oh, sorry, n minus m said the other way around. I, okay, that's not going to make a difference. n minus m, that's 3 minus 2, that's that. And 6 minus 5, that, it's always going to be 1. It's actually always going to be even. So, so I'm I meant to go over here. My God. So that's, uh, this is always going to be odd. It's not going to be even. That's wrong. m squared minus n squared is odd. Hmm. Okay, it's going to be one of these two, okay? So let's see. n squared minus m squared, m squared plus m squared. So let's try which one of this is going to be. Uh, let's try n squared minus m squared. n squared minus m squared. And then the other one is m squared plus m squared. And it's saying, okay, this is always odd, and this is always even, okay? If you just look at our examples, and here are the examples that we, we chose, okay? Let's do uh, n squared, let's do this one, okay? And because then, if you do this one, you get, okay, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, okay? Uh, 9 plus 4 is 13. Okay, that's odd. So that's not going to work. So that's the answer by default. So you can do this by counter example like that. Or you can see this. See, n squared minus m squared. This is a special case of what I told you before. a squared minus b squared is a plus b times a minus b, right? So you can fact this out. I don't know. I'm not sure if any student would be doing this on the exam, but just to illustrate, this is n plus m times n minus m. Okay, so then you get that. Okay, what's the big deal? Okay, well, n minus m, so six minus five, is always going to be one. We said right because they're consecutive, so this is always one. So n plus m, okay, times one. Okay, so that's just n plus m. Okay. Now, is this always odd? Okay, 3 plus 2 is 5, 6, point, 6 and 5 is 5, because you, 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 can't, you, you, you can't take an even number and an odd number. It's always even plus odd. It's always going to give you an odd number, right? So that's the, that's the case. So the answer here is, is this, okay? Uh, because any number squared minus this, I, that, that's going to be an odd number. The way to answer this question, I think, on an exam would be just take some uh, examples of consecutive numbers. And I would pick, like, you know, uh, some negative number, like, you know, neg negative 2 and negative 1, and like 2 and 3, and 5 and 6, just to, and then just try this out. And I think that's a faster way of answering this. Question number 53. If function p is defined as follows, Okay, so this function is defined as follows. So for x, when x is greater than this, that's the function. And x is less than this, that's the function. This is an interesting concept if, if you have done an algebra. So you can define a function. I can say I have a function. I'm going to call it k of x, okay? But I'm going to define it. If, and k of x is, if x is greater than or equal to 0, then k of x is x squared. Okay, and if x is less than zero, if it's a negative number, then k of x is uh, 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 I'm just going to say k of x is x. Okay, so in this case, I said when x is greater than zero or equal to zero, f of x is going to be behaving like this, as this, and when x is less than zero for this domain. The function is this, and that's a line x like that. So here's the composite of this. All of this is k of x, but I use two different functions to define this, and that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Okay. Uh, so in this case, we're told uh, uh, that we're defining a p of x, 
and you define it differently for domain of x is greater than 0, and you define it differently for a domain that's uh, when x is less than 0. Okay, So it's testing you whether or not you recognize the functions can be defined for, uh, uh, for, uh, based on domains uh, like this. And then we are asked to find what is p of negative 1. Well, to find the p of negative 1, we're going to have to use this function because that's, the fun that's how the function uh, uh, is defined for x is less than 0. So all you have to do is substitute this and this. So p of negative 1 is going to equal to negative, negative 5 squared, that's this, plus negative 1 to the 4th power, plus 36 times negative 1, minus 36. Okay, negative fifth to the fifth power is negative one. Negative one times one, well, that's one. And negative one to the fourth power, that's one. And this is minus 36, minus 36, okay? Negative, this is negative 72 plus two, so this is negative 70. Okay, the answer is A. Okay? That's a polynomial function. Now, for a project in home economics class, Kirk is making a tablecloth. Very good. Kirk doesn't want to go get a tablecloth from a store, so he's going to make it. So he's going to get some. Uh, it's a good project, I think, because he can learn so sewing and stuff. Okay, so project uh, in home economic class. Kirk is making a tablecloth for a circular table that's three feet in diameter. So the table itself is three feet in diameter. Okay, three feet. Let me make sure I get the feet in there. The finished tablecloth needs to hang down five inches. So it's going to hang down five inches right here. That's inches, not feet, mind you. Five inches this way, hang down five inches this way. Over the edge of the tablecloth. So it's going to hang down five. Okay. So if you look at this from the side, it will hang down. Here's a table. It's going to hang down five inches like this. That's going to be three feet over here. Okay. That's five inches. Okay. And it's going to be fancy tablecloth over the edge of the table. To finish the edge of the tablecloth, Kirk will fold under and sew down one inch of the material all the way around. So it's going to like do one of these. It's going to one inch, it's going to fold backwards like this. So one inch is like that. Okay, one inch is like that. Okay, wow. Okay, Kirk is going to, okay, now he's going to, his, his fabric is rectangular shape. He's going to go to, you know, you know, fabric shop and get a rectangular shaped fabric. It's not going to come circular shaped fabric, right? That's going to be 60 inches wide. So it's going to be like 60 inches from here to here. It's good. Fabric is 60 inches wide. Okay. What is the shortest length of fabric in inches Kirk uh, could use to make the tablecloth without putting any separate piece of fabric together? Okay. That's a, all right. So this is an easy question if you understand what they're actually asking for. And it's, it's a mind-boggling question, I think, otherwise. So it's one inch is over there. See? This inch is folded over, right? So if you can imagine, the whole tablecloth will actually look like this. Obviously, this is not drawn to scale. So the actual tablecloth here is three feet. Okay? And there's six inches over here. Six inches. And there's six inches over here. Correct? Because one inch is folded over. So the whole diameter of this tablecloth over here, from here to here, okay, it's going to be three feet plus, well, six inches plus six inches, that's another feet, that's four feet. So that's the diameter of, the, of this tablecloth, okay? Then the question says, well, it's going to come from a rectangular um, uh, thingy. So if, if this is the circle, okay, and it's going to be four feet this way. It's going to be four feet this way. The smallest amount of cloth that's going to fit this is going to be like a square, right? It's going to be a square like this. And the square is going to have each side. This is going to be four feet. Four feet is what? 12 times 4? 4, 48 inches this way. 48 inches. That's four feet. Four feet. So it's going to have to be 48 inches square cloth that he's going to have to go to the store and get. That's that. Okay, and he's going to waste this part of it, but you know, that's okay. I mean, that's the least amount of stuff that he's going to be able to waste. Okay, so that's that question over here. All right. Question number 55 says, The equations of two graphs shown below are, there are two equations, there's this one. 
y equals a1 times sine of b1t and then this second one y2 is a2 times the cosine of b2t okay so this first one the dotted one is the sine curve and the, the solid one is a cosine curve okay all right so where the val where the constants b1 and b2 are both positive real numbers so these are positive they're telling you and the question is so which of the following statements is true regarding a and b so we're asked to, a1 and a1 and a2 so we're asked to compare a1 and a2 now this is an easy question if you know some basics about the sine curve and the cosine curve and it's an impossible question or a tough question otherwise okay so the base this is one thing you have to know okay let's just just draw some sine curve and the cosine curve graphs okay let's try to make them okay the basic sine curve if you recall looks like this okay the basic cosine curve looks like this okay and I remember these this by is a cute picture like this see cozy cosine curves it starts from here it looks like a hammock right cozy cosine curve I like this one so so this is the cozy cosine curve right cozy cos that's cosine and this is the sine so sine starts here cosine starts over there okay so the graph of y equals sine of x looks like this the graph of y equals cosine of x looks like that now there's a the a goes in the front see y equals a sine of x the a is the ampl uh, uh, a is the amplitude it's, it's like how high this curve is going to be so if you if you do y equals 2 sine of x compared to this one it's going to go higher it's going to go twice as higher up and twice as lower down like this okay same thing with cosine if you increase if you make it two times of that it'll go two times higher like that and two times lower like that okay that's what a does so a controls the amplitude of this okay all right so b controls the width of the uh, 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 over here okay uh, uh, the, the period we not this question doesn't ask us about that because this is the period of the uh, of the graph from here to here and B controls that okay but the question is about amplitude that's about a okay now uh, if the the bigger the a is the bigger this is okay so uh, and then the bigger that is right okay so that you have to know to be able to answer this question so now you look at this graph okay now you can you can clearly see here that okay this is a cosine curve right it starts here as a cosine curve going down over here nice cozy cosine curve right and then the sine curve is kind of going berserk so to speak it's kind of like going oh it's like yeah, this is a sine curve it's going way up higher right it's going like this that's the sine curve right so you can see the sine curve is going much higher than this so that's the amplitude so the amplitude of the sine curve which is a1 it was much bigger than the amplitude of the cosine curve so this is the amplitude of the sine curve amplitude and that's the amplitude of cosine curve over there so in this from this picture you can glean that a1 is bigger than a2 that's what it is so um, and they're both positive okay and because why because now the reason is this so this is the basic sine curve okay and the cosine curve correct now the y equals sine of x is this y equals okay negative sine of x if you just make this negative it just flips the whole graph see it makes it like this okay it flips the graph okay this is kind of like mirror image that's what it does since there's no flipping of these graphs see this looks like a basic sine curve that looks like a basic cosine curve that means they both have to be positive numbers correct so uh, it gives you the amplitude and also whether or not it is the graph is flipped so they're both greater than zero and uh, what, what did we say we said a1 is greater than a2 right if I get this correctly so a1 is greater than a2 
okay a1 is the sine curve okay so and uh, so and so it's going to be they're both greater so 0 is less than a2 which is less than a1 that's what the question of is frame so that's the answer here because a1 is the biggest okay like that all right so that's some basics of sine and cosine curve okay the period if you're just curious over here that's the period of the graph over here and for these curves is 2 pi divided by b in that case okay 2 pi divided by b. okay F question 57 almost there Question 56. For x such that x is between 0 and pi to the expression this is equivalent to what? This looks like, you know, a very scary expression. Oopsie daisy, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, I, don't know. I wish I could I don't know how to undo this. Edit, uh, undo. Okay, so it looks kind of scary, okay? But uh, it's not as scary as it looks if you know a few basic things, okay? Now, We've, I talked about trigonometric you know, functions, uh, trigonometric uh, ratios before, but this you got to know. Sine square of x plus cosine square of x equals 1. This is basic trigonometric property, okay? So you have to know this to solve this question, okay? Now this question looks complicated, if you, uh, but it's that not that bad. 1 minus cosine square over sine square okay so it's like this so square root of 1 minus cosine squared of x over sine of x okay got that okay plus the square root of 1 minus sine squared of x over what cosine of x okay so this expression will simplify so how do I know that this this question had to involve with this well if you're familiar with the basic trigonometry and if you're familiar with this if, uh, then you can almost see this as another version of this okay because you can solve this for was well, for example you can solve this for sine squared so sine squared of x is 1 minus cosine squared of x see see 1 minus cosine squared of x over here can be replaced with sine squared of x so this becomes square root of sine squared of x over sine of x plus over here 1 minus sine squared of x now you can sign this for solve this for cosine squared of x 1 minus sine squared of x see you can replace this with cosine squared of x cosine squared of x and over cosine of x then you realize okay well square root of sine squared is sine of x over sine of x Square root of cosine squared is cosine of x over cosine of x. Okay, and then these simplify. Sine divided by sine is 1, cosine divided by cosine is 1, and that is 2. Okay, so the answer is 2. So this question tests uh, uh, if you are able to recognize this simple basic um, trigonometric um, identity. Okay, of uh, Ooh. sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x sometimes you can write it as if you want to sound fancy sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equals 1 theta being some angle okay but gotta know this and you have to be able to manipulate this basic identity into these two forms because you see them very frequently okay that's number 56 number 57 is this consider the function f of x equals square root of x so we're given two functions this one f of x is the square root of x and g of x is this in the standard xy plane y is f of g of x okay and passes through 4 6 what is the value of b uh, this is a very good question so um, this is what we're given okay we're told is f of x is square root of x. So f of x 
a square root of x. And we're told that g of x is uh, 7x plus b. 7x plus b. And then we're told, we're given a third function, y is f of g of x, like this. Correct? y is f of g of x. And we're told that this uh, function y passes through 4, 6. Okay? This function goes through 4, 6. Okay. That's a lot of information, okay? And then we're asked to find what is the what is the value of b. That's like, oh my god, what is going on over here? So then we're asked to find what is this. That's a lot of information. But what's really testing is, first of all, do you recognize this? This is called a composite function. Composite function. In other words, it's a function inside of a function. Okay, so that's called a composite function. Uh, 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 so what that means is, okay, if I ask what's f of x, right? right what's f of uh, 0 or f of 1, okay? That means you plug in 0 in here and you get 0. If you plug in 1 over there, you get 1, right? That's what that means. That's how it means. Then if I ask you, what's f of g of x? All you do is you put the g of x in where, where you would put these numbers. So we take g of x and you substitute it over there. Okay, so f of g of x is just put it in over there. So that's what we're told here. We're told that y... The function y is a composite function where you put g of x and you put it in f of x. You take this and you substitute that in the place of x and then you get y. So what's y? So y is going to be the square root of, when you substitute this in there, you get 7x plus b. That's what y is. Okay? So now that you know, okay, okay that's a composite function. Now you know that's y. Okay, good. Then the second part of this question is very also interesting. Now it says, okay, now we know what y is. Let me actually write over here. Okay, so now we're told that this function, okay, it goes through this point over here. Okay, if a function goes through a certain point, it means that point satisfies the function. In other words, if you substitute that ordered pair into the function, it satisfies the equation. It makes the equation true. So it will, all it means that this function going through that point means this value will satisfy this function over there. So then you substitute. Okay, 6 for y and 4 for x, like this. And then you're asked, what is b? Well, that becomes easy to solve. All you do is you have to solve for b. So let me rewrite this. 6 equals square root of 7 times 4 is 28, plus b. Square both sides, right? To solve this, you have to square both sides. Then you get 36 equals 28 plus b. And then you subtract 28 from both sides. And then you get b to be equal to 8. Like that. Okay? So then the answer is b is 8. So this question asks you several things, okay? This question, first of all, asks you, do you understand what a composite function is, a function inside of a function? So why was a composite function of g of x and, and f? That means you take g of x and, and put it in place of x in the, in the f of x function. They'll give you the y, that's a new function. And then it asks, do you understand what it means for a function to pass through a point? That means this point will satisfy this equation and then and then you solve for b okay that's 58 question number 59 58 okay the triangle x y z that is shown below has the side lengths x y and z so typically as you can see over here the vertices are named with capital letters and side lengths are named with small letters okay it's just, just mustahab, it's just like mathematical matters. It doesn't have to be like that, but that's what they do. The, the triangle XYZ that is shown below has side lengths XYZ inches and is not a, and it's not a right triangle. Okay, okay, it's good to know. Let X, X prime, okay, let X prime be the image of X when the triangle is reflected across YZ. So here's YZ. The triangle is reflected, means a mirror image across this. Okay, 
If you take a mirror image across this, like this, the x will fall over here, see? So this would be x prime, okay? What, which of the following is the expression for the perimeter in inches of the quadrilateral x prime? So you have a new quadrilateral here, like this. x prime, y, x, and z. Well, if you, if you reflect this, it's all, the, this y will be reflected over here, and z is reflected over here. Okay, so you're reflecting this. So that's what it means to reflect. So the perimeter is going to be this plus this plus this plus this. So y plus y plus z plus z. That's 2y plus 2z. Now look at the choices. That's not given. Okay, factor out of 2, I get y plus z, like this. So 2 times the quantity, y plus z, like that. Okay, that's the perimeter of the quadrilateral. 59. A function f is odd function if and only if f of opposite of x equals negative f of x for every value of x in the domain of x. One of the functions graphed in the standard form, uh, in the standard x-ray coordinate plane below, is an odd function. Which one of this is an odd function? This is an easy question if you know, if you remember this from algebra. Uh, class, but if you don't remember this, what this is saying this if is definition of an odd function is if you put an opposite of x, you get negative f of x. For example, if this is x value over here, okay, and if you go to the opposite of x over here, okay, if you plug that into the function, you get opposite of f of x. Okay, so this is x and this is f of x. Okay, and this value here will be f of negative x, right here. So this is negative x. So if it's an odd function, f of negative x is opposite of that. Well, in this case, it's not the same because they're the same. Okay? Now, let me explain to you this in a little bit of a detail, okay? So the function is odd if f of opposite of x equals opposite of f of x, okay? I'll, I'll show you by an example, and then, then, you'll, then you'll get the concept, okay? Once you get the concept, then this becomes an easy question. Here's an example, see, of an odd function. So, so this is x, okay, and you go up over here, and you get f of x, the value of that. Now, if I were to go back to the other side, the opposite side over here, so this is like opposite of x, and if I plug that into the function I get over here, this would be the f of opposite of x, correct? Okay, so I, you get that. So this is x and this is opposite of x. This is f of x and this is the f of opposite of x. But now you compare these two points, say, okay? So f of x is over here, okay? f of opposite of x is over here. They're opposite. So if this was 3, this would be like negative 3. You follow? So this is an example of a odd function where f of x is like this and opposite of x is like this. So whenever a function is like this, okay, opposite of x is like this, okay, so this is f of x and this is negative f of x, negative like this, opposite. So that's an odd function. And they always look like this. They're symmetrical about, but I mean, these two quadrants over here, okay. Now this function over here is not an odd, an odd function. In fact, it's, it's called an even function. Like this is f of x, this is opposite of x, and they're both the same. Okay. So if you're looking for this, this graph over here, which is y equals x uh, cubed graph over here, this is a classic example of an odd function over here. If you know this, it doesn't have to be like this. Is one example of the odd function. Okay. There are there are infinite different examples you can give. So that's an odd function. That's what it means for a function to be odd. Okay, opposite of x is okay, is 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 this, and this value here is negative f of x. Okay, all right. So we're looking for something that looks like this. Now, if you look at the graphs here, all right, uh, none of these satisfy the. Okay, okay. Because at first they're not symmetrical, except for ooh, this one here, which is uh, actually a classic odd example of an odd function over there. 
Okay, so uh, the other ones you can try out. You can x and opposite of x and x and opposite of x. Okay, they don't work that way. And the last question. What is the real value of x in the equation? In other words, solve this equation. We're told log base 2 of x. Let me get this. Log base 2 of 24 minus log base 2 of 3 equals log 5. Okay, let's write this and solve this log equation. So log base 2 of 24 minus log base 2 of... Log base 2 minus log base 2 of 3 equals um, log base 5 of x. Okay, to solve this log equation, you have to know the logarithmic rules. All right, so um, the basic log rules, okay. How, you have to be able to simplify an expression like this. The way I do that is like this, okay, you have to know that. So we have to be able to simplify basic log expressions like this, 2 to the 8. Now when I see log with two numbers like this, I imagine in my mind, 2 to what exponent equals 8? Okay? Well, 2 to the third is going to be 8. Uh, it's going to be 8, so the answer is 3. In other words, log base 2 of 8 is 2. If I give you another example, log base 5 of 25, what is this? Well, 5 to what exponent equals 25? That's 2. So log base 2, log base 5 of 25 is 2. That's one thing you have to know to be able to do this question. Okay, so, and then uh, uh, that's that. And then this is this. So before we do this, okay, well, there's nothing easy that gives me over here. It's not a nice number over here, okay? Well, then you have to know a second rule. That's the rule that you have to know is this, the multiplication rule. Okay, log of a times b is log of a plus log of b. That's not going to help us. Okay, well, how about this one? Log of a over b is going to equal to log of a minus log of b. Hmm, this is going to help us here because, well, it's like this over here. So you can go backwards too. So you can go from here to here or, or from here to here. Okay, so we can simplify this using that. Okay, so let's do that. So now we get, okay, so this becomes log base 2 of 24 divided by 3 equals log base 5 of x. Oh, that's good. I can, these are divisible. Now I get log base 2 of 8. Oh, that's good. I get that. Equals log base 5 of x. Oh, I know how to do this because then you go log base 2 of 8. 2 to the what exponent is equal to 8? Well, that's 3. So, this simplifies to 3 equals log base 5 of x. Now, you have to be able to convert this log equation to exponential form. Okay? And the way you do that is log base 5, if we have log, okay, base uh, b to the exponent e equals y, okay? It's like this. This Things like this. So you have to be able to convert a log equation to exponential form. The exponential form log of y equals b to the x converts to this. Log base b to the exponent x equals that. Log base b to the exponent x equals y. So this is a basic logs uh, property you have to know. In this case then you do this. Okay well 5 to the exponent 3 equals x. Hmm. Then x is 5 cubed, that's 25 times is 125. All right, so that's how you solve this question. The last one, the answer is 125, I believe. So this question tested several law properties. Uh, as in conclusion, I'll just enumerate these for you. So log of a times b is log of a plus log of b, and log of a over b is log of a minus log of b and then log of a to the exponent b okay is log is b is b times log of a okay 
So in other words, you take the B and bring it up in front over here like that. And uh, uh, log of 1 is 0. Log of 1 uh, in any base is 0. Um, and then one last property is uh, log of um, B A, base B to A, is log of A over log of B. So these are some log properties uh, that are very important to know. Uh, and then uh, you should be able to convert also, of course, from uh, uh, exponential forms to logarithmic forms like this. So y equals b to the x uh, in logarithmic forms, log base b to the exponent x is y like this. So you have to be able to do this and you have to know them, some of these basic log rules uh, to be able to solve these log equations, um, inshallah. Uh, until next time then. Salatu wassalamu wa rasulullah wa rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum.